Welcome to the program. You know, I am a journalist by trade, but I'm an anthropologist by training, and I am very proud to be a graduate of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Virginia. And I can think of no better way to help us make sense of the historic and to millions of Americans startling results of the recent presidential election than by talking with a professor of anthropology. My good friend Richard Handler joins me on the program. Richard is an anthropologist and director of the Global Studies Program at the University of Virginia. Thank you, sir, for being here. My pleasure. We've had many talks in many coffee shops. Yes, we'll we have continue. indeed. I'm so glad you could be here. So, Richard, help us. For, from Based on your training and your many, many years studying culture around the world and nationalist, populist movements, how do you make sense? And what's the frame that you look through to understand what is taking place now in America? Well, of course, it's a a fascinating moment. Uh, certainly I, as, a, as an intellectual, as a voter, uh, find it a frightening moment, but it's a fascinating moment because Trump, or Trump versus Clinton, uh, brought out so many kind of deep structural um, tensions in anthropology, uh, sorry, not in anthropology, in American culture, that uh, anyone who has studied our continent, our, our, our nation state, um, can see being repeated over and over again. So I tend to think of this not, there's a lot of talk now about, oh, we've made so much progress, now we're going back. And I don't, the problem with that narrative is that uh, um, I, don't, I don't know that we can ever escape this back and forth between what, what Trump has catalyzed and what the Democrats try, or what Barack Obama catalyzed. Um, I, I see this going all the way back to the origins of the problem of slavery at the beginning of the nation, which creates a nation that has a kind of deep contradiction at the center of it, which on the one hand all men, I suppose, or all people are created equal, on the other hand slavery. And it's so, we, we keep going back and forth between those two positions. That tension is, is in our DNA it's, as it's Americans. In the, it's in the DNA. And you, you can see it over and over again. And I would like to frame this actually in terms of a couple of questions that you and I have talked about. One way to talk about that tension is, is to talk about the question of who is a real American. And then, so the white side, the black side, the, you know, you can think of it that way. Or another way to, to think about it is who gets to count as a person? Who gets to be an American? So if you have a founding document that says uh, all men are created equal and men comes to mean people, you still have the problem is who is a person. So if you, if you have a group of people who are enslaved, they're not persons under that model, or not complete persons. Is a fetus a person? Is a child a person? Well, yes, a child is a person, but a child doesn't get to vote. Is a woman a person? It took women a long time is to- Is a corporation a person? Is a corporation a right. person? So you have these, and those two questions, who is a person and what is the real America, um, intersect because as a nation state, the, real, the term the real America, or make America great again, make it real again, would, yeah. would identify the people who are the real Americans and would get rid of the people who aren't the real Americans, um, such as the you know, people who are not supposed to be you know, what, uh, you know, undocumented people right, or, right. Or, or Black Lives Matter people, depending on how you define the other. Yeah. So, and uh, Trump defined the other, has spent years defining the other as Barack Obama. That well, he's in not racial terms. Genuine, yeah, yeah. He's, he's from Africa, right. show me your birth certificate. Right. He was the president of the birthers before he became president-elect of America. Right, and of course Trump's history as a racist, uh, or his racist actions, I, I don't know that we need to call people racists, but we can certainly identify actions that are racist. Yeah. And it goes all the way back to the 60s with the lawsuit against the, you know, the housing discrimination. Yeah, very um, well documented. Yeah, so you have Trump um, bringing to the surface in a very, very media savvy way um, a, a kind of um, a racism and a misogyny. And though, you know, so women are not persons the way men are and people of color are not persons the way we white people are. And he... Um, and the political establishment you know, politicians, journalists, professors, they're not real Americans. They're not real Americans. Like either. you are. That's the, right. The rural, white, often less educated supporters that he had at those rallies in terrific numbers, 
That was his message to them. Right. None, none of the, these people aren't real people like you are, and these people aren't real Americans. And like that's you another are. dichotomy: elites versus real people. Yeah. And you know, all elites are not liberals or left-wing people, but they've been portrayed that way. Yeah. And uh, another dichotomy is city-country. So it's just amazing that if you think of the election, Hillary Clinton won more votes than Donald Trump. Probably most of her votes came from cities, and. So if you look at the map of America, it looks almost completely red, but those are very sparsely populated areas. But there's a long tradition of uh, city versus country with the idea that the city is the place of vice, it's the place of foreigners, it's the place, uh, uh, and Trump, of, there's a great yeah. irony, Trump is a New Yorker. And the country is Corruption, the place, yeah. And that's the country with the, the white, you know, the, the, <laughs> right, right. the, 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 the uh, sylvan spaces. So Trump just, you know, kind of masterfully um, exploited that. And the, uh, another theme that I, I want to bring to the table that I mentioned to you a few days ago, uh, if you think that the elites are not real people, the real people are out there in the countryside, and politicians, of course, are, 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 are said to be not, they're not authentic, they're not real people. And I think one thing that Trump, you have the Trump versus Bernie phenomenon, and I think Trump is absolutely brilliant. I was not sure it's brilliant, it may just be a kind of canniness, but he I think of Trump as the as a completely authentic liar, a complete. He's P.T. Barnum. He's a completely authentic con man, because here's this guy who just lies constantly, and everybody knows he's lying, and and says outrageous things like Hillary Clinton should be jailed or or something like. That. And and people in the crowd, you know, on the one hand, they they may they may like the idea that Hillary Clinton should be jailed, but in some way they know that some of this is not to be said or is wrong, or, but they love the fact that he's willing to say it. Even the not showing your taxes, you know, Trump His supporters said, admired that. Yeah, because yeah. He's, he's, not, he's authentically, man, uh, an authentic manipulator, an yeah. authentic con man. And they liked the fact that he was standing up to the establishment. Exactly. The establishment, the journalists, they got their hands out for your tax returns, don't give it to them. Right. And you Clinton, know, screw those people. And Clinton, of course, uh, who I think has many virtues, but nonetheless, she rep represented the establishment. We should remember that it's, it's been very hard historically since Roosevelt for parties to hold the White House for more than two terms. Right, right. I think Reagan and the first Bush is, are, is the only example of three terms. And Reagan and the second Bush lost to Clinton. Yeah. So it's, it's hard. It, people said that in a normal year, the Democrats would have a hard time holding the White House. Yeah. That they also said if there had been a decent candidate, Bush, Rubio, Clinton would have had a, hadn't, wouldn't have had a chance. And Americans have always been, you know, we're talking here about these, these long narratives that have been at work at play right. here. In a sense, there's very little that's new there, here. Right, that's exactly right. Um, because, you know, Thomas Jefferson was the anti-establishment candidate in 1800. And a slaveholder. <laughs> Both. And, and a slaveholder, Yeah, and he, yeah. Was, he was country versus city. Right, and he so was on. running on this idea that I'm a simple farmer right. and I'm from the rural countryside right. where real Americans live mm -hmm. and not you corrupt people in, in Washington. Right, so Trump, um, I, th I think it was just remarkable that he was able to parlay the absolute willingness to lie or to say anything or to be shocking um, into uh, uh, people bought that as a you know this is a, a genuine person yeah and of course Bernie was a genuine actor also but for very different reasons Gen Bernie's a real person because he's a, the rare pop, pop, uh, politician who seems to have a kind of a consistent message and he doesn't um, hedge very much Clinton's been around in the spotlight so much longer that she and she's been attacked so vociferously yeah, yeah. that she can't she has to be very careful in what she says and I don't think Bernie had to be particularly careful and in those moments in the campaign when he was sort of caught when the um, Black Lives Matter folks confronted yeah, him said you don't really care about us he yeah. gave them the microphone and he was able to get through that uh, that didn't damage much his image as a person who's really authentic and so so um, well, you know, throughout this, I've done so many interviews over the last few months, Richard, of scholars saying, you know, Donald Trump is a classic demagogue. Right. He is exactly what you know, the founders warned us about right. because they were terrific students of history. They knew Greek and Roman history. They, they grew up on stories of Caesar. And they knew how demagogues played on fear, played on prejudices, played on anger, especially among a mob, a, a citizenry. And they knew that person who does that as a political tactic to empower himself, history tells us over and over again, 
is a very dangerous person. Yeah, and I, I don't know if they would have come up with the idea of uh, sort of the, the authentic liar. I don't know if they would have thought of demagogues that way. Perhaps they, they would have. Um, so you're absolutely right. And of course, Trump, I feel uh, that um, the Obama presidency was, an, it was a kind of an accident. So in the sense that I never thought I would see an African American in the White House in my lifetime. I didn't either. Yeah. And the Bush presidency was a disaster due to a, 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 an unforeseen event, which is to say 9-11, which led him into a disastrous war, which destroyed the Republican, sort of Republican credibility. And Obama came along, uh, got into the limelight in the 2004 election as a, you know, a wonderful speaker and a charismatic leader. Right. And, um, to, was able to win the nomination in 2008. So you get the first African-American president in history. And I don't know if this is your recollection of it, but my recollection is that sort of for one or two days, people almost across the spectrum said, this is wonderful, this shows what a great place America is. A very brief moment of that. And then, of course, the racism surfaced. The people, yeah. the crying white people saying this, this I want my country back. It wasn't until January of 2009 that we started seeing what would become the Tea Party start to come together through the, through the protests against his presidency. And um, I need to take a quick break, but when we get back, I, I want to pick up on that theme of, um, of the tension of, the, of, of dealing with that original sin of slavery in the American story and that tension, that back and forth. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get back. We're talking with anthropologist Richard Handler of the University of Virginia. I'm Coy Barefoot. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking with Richard Handler, professor of anthropology at the University of Virginia and director of the Global Studies Program. Richard, early in this conversation, we talked about the, um, the original sin of slavery and that tension that has always been part of the American story. It's not new. It's always there, this culture of contradiction um, and this interplay. What does it say? about America in the context of that tension that the first president that the nation chooses following its first African-American president is Donald Trump, yeah, who, is, well. who has demonstrated for decades very well documented racist behavior, misogyny. Um, for years he was uh, you know, accusing the president of not being a quote unquote real American, of being African. And you know it's it's all racist code language. You're not one of us. Right. You're you're from Africa. Um, well, my own my own sense of this is that the, and I don't know what a historian would say, but I would say that the original sin is so profound that it it, it will take centuries to work its way out. It's it's so difficult to talk about if you think of an issue like reparations, which make almost no sense to white people, but if you thought about it. If you came from Mars and you looked at the situation and you said that people who'd been enslaved for 200 years and had their labor stolen for 100 or 200 years, maybe they do deserve something like reparations. So, but the, my point is that the original sin is so profound, it's, you can't simply transcend it. And one of the things that's happened in the last 50 years um, is that uh, with the civil rights movement in the 50s, um, Afri and then the, the feminist, various feminist movements, both African-American people and women um, gained a new um, level of esteem or uh, earned the right to a certain kind of r respect, got, earned the right to be seen as persons yeah, in America. Yeah. And, but this, finally. Finally. <laughs> but this deeply troubles some p 
people who, you know, sort of the other side. Right, right. And I, I believe that um, uh, one of the early manifestations of this is uh, part of the story that uh, the Trump, uh, the Trump story, is the, um, the the fight over political correctness or the notion of the PC. So in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when feminists and uh, African Americans and various others began to demand respect. You can't say these words anymore. You can't treat us this way. Um, that then got labeled by the other side as being a kind of policing of their right to express themselves. And, and, the, and they started using the term political correctness, which is a kind of neutral way. What I think political correctness is, it's anti-anti-racism. So if you think of the civil rights movement, that's anti-racism. They make some gains. And then, but then there's pushback. There's pushback. There's backlash. And you can't. The pushback doesn't say we're in favor of racism. It says you folks have instituted this this thought police stuff on us, which we're going to call PC, and we're against that. And so here you have Trump, who's a master. He says, I don't care about PC. I'm going to, uh, you know, call women or. I'm going to use these words. I'm going yes. to say. I'm going to say things. what I want to say, and his supporters love that. Right. They, so he speaks his mind. Right. Yeah. And one, I think, one of the problems that the Democrats had was, and I'm not sure of this, but if you think about the the um, speeches or the rallies that Clinton and her surrogates gave, they would denounce Trump. They would say, "You've insulted women. You've insulted black people. You've insulted Mexicans." So their argument was um, an anti-racist argument, in very simple terms. But they had no way to talk. What they needed was an anti, anti, anti racist <laughs> argument. And they had no way to conceptualize it. I mean, they needed to be able to say, there's a reason that Trump gets so much power from saying, saying these things out loud, because the other side feels so burdened by not being allowed to they say They feel muzzled. Things. They feel muzzled. Right? I feel muzzled because I can't it's be a an, racist. It's an attack I can't on, be a misogynist. Right. It's an attack on free speech. Right. I, free speech to me means saying the N-word when I want to. That's right. Or, That's or, right. Or, you know, calling a, a coworker who happens to be a female some kind of epithet in the work in right. the workplace. I should be able to do that. Exactly, and and I think this anger has built up for thirty or forty years. Yeah. And then you get the Obama presidency, and as I like to say to my students, a black man in the White House, the, the symbol it drove these people nuts. Um, <laughs> and not to mention the fact, I mean, we could say that um, Republicans, just policy-wise, they've always hated these safety net programs, they, for reasons I don't completely understand, but they're deeply against a, a federal a, a health plan. Yeah. And, you know, so that added They've to They've been it. opposed to this kind of stuff back to FDR. That's right. That's right. Um, so there are political Unless motives. it's a social safety net for Wall Street, and that's going right. to bail out companies that have been run into the ground by their corporate boards. But well, but they're even willing to not be in favor of that. And Obama gets criticized by the real Americans for bailing out Wall Street. Yeah, so true. that becomes a complicated What do you think about, you've spent a lot of time studying nationalist mm -hmm. movements. What should we understand about the nationalism that we've seen over the last few months? And what do you think it means going forward? How, how should we really, because there's something very deep and important there well, that Trump has tapped into. It's actually, I don't think that hard to understand, and we've already, or the, the basic model, and we've already talked about it. So in, in nationalisms, whether it's American or Canadian or French, uh, the nation is defined as a bounded group. So we know who we are, and those people over there are not us. They're clear boundaries. And, and um, then you have to define who is it who's in the in-group? And as I said, the, a struggle from the beginning in the American story is who gets to count as a person. So nation states yeah, are- Yeah, the very idea of citizenship, yeah, citizenship is a club. Right. We can right. decide who gets it and right. who doesn't. And look yeah. at how important boundaries are. So yes, you can have immigrants who come across the boundary, across the border, but they can't pierce it or violate it in an illegal way because, and this is common to nationalisms, if you let in alien elements in an uncontrolled fashion, they will pollute and destroy the nation, which has to be pure, real, however you define it. And this it. isn't America in the 21st century. This is the, in the human story. Well, it's the nationalist story. Yeah, this model yeah. only, you know, this is model is maybe three centuries old. So if you think of the medieval European world, it's not built that way. Knights and serfs are not the same kind of people, and they're not supposed to be the same kind of people. So those are not societies that are built on the idea that everybody's the same. You can have a society that's built on the idea that everybody is different and contributes in different ways. Right, right. But modernity, these nation states are defined as every, everybody is the same. But then the problem is, 
what's the definition of same? And that's what we're yeah. seeing this fight is about, man, woman, black, white, documented, undocumented. All these s structural tensions that have been at, at play since the very beginning. But it's a very simple question. We have boundaries. We are united. Who are we? Yeah. It's really simple. So let's not, we don't want to leave viewers with the impression that, oh, well, this is an old story. It's all been around. Because you actually begin the conversation by saying, the results of this election I find frightening. What is it that's particularly unique and I know you're not a political scientist, but what's unique in this iteration well, of I, that I, historic tension? I think what's good about the current moment is that Trump has actually brought to the surface these simmering tensions and, force, and has forced people to confront them. Uh, I think that's valuable. What's bad about it is that Trump has surrounded himself with really violent, vile people. And of course, I'm a Jewish person, and there are openly anti-Semitic people in Trump's yeah, world. Absolutely, and we just don't know. He, you know, there's the whole business about he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not a politician. He doesn't know about anything about running something like the federal government. So it's going to be turned over to professional Republican politicians, um, leavened by or, or accompanied by um, these people who are allowed to be openly racist, anti-Semitic, and misogynist. And we just don't know where that's going to take us. I, I doubt in my lifetime I'll, that I'll see them rounding me up because of my background. But of course, with the example of Nazi Germany, everybody has to think about that. Yeah, because uh, you just don't know. I you mean, just it, don't know where it's going to go. And when, um, you know, when Hitler rose to power early on, no one foresaw. No one in Germany foresaw right. what it would happen. And we should remind people that at the time, Germany was the most literate, educated, yeah, yeah. cultured country on the planet. Yeah, but they this, were this is not about education. It's about sort of deeply irrational cultural dichotomies. Let me pick up on that point, because you say this is not about education. What's your reaction to the vilification that we see from the Trump campaign uh, and his supporters against people like you and me, journalists, professors? Yeah. Um, are we just part of that establishment that they find so horrifying and anti-American? I, I, I suppose. I think this is a hard question, and I'm not sure I can give you a good answer. But, but clearly, part of it is the reaction against elites. They don't want elites telling them what to believe or what to think. And part of it is that they perceive many of these elites to be left-wing, and actually Jewish, for that matter, yeah. uh, even though, of course, universities, if you look at universities across their entirety, they are not uniformly left-wing. Anthropology departments are, but business schools are not, or engineering schools are not, religious schools are not. So it's actually a kind of a myth that the professoriate is uniformly left. Yeah. But that certainly is a, a, a myth that uh, Trump and his allies were able to, and, and, many, and many other people yeah. have promoted. Speaking of the university, I'm curious, over the last few days, in your classes, what's been the reaction of your students when they come to class. Are they talking about this? So I uh, taught a class on Wednesday, a class of 120 students, and I taught a class on Thursday, a class of 150 students. And my, I should say, tell the audience that my classes are not a, a random sample, because I'm known as a professor with a certain orientation. And so my audience is heavily liberal, and it's also hev heavily female. Uh, anthropology students as undergraduates are heavily female. Uh, that's true across the country. Remember that UVA is now um, 55, 45 women to men. So any class wow. is going to have... that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> but my classes are probably 75, 25 women to men. And that's because of my, the things I teach and my orientation. But anyway, um, the students were... Many of them were very, very uh, distressed. I had two or three white women, in fact, break down in tears. Uh, both white women and women of color talked about being afraid uh, of violence against them on the part of white men or just on the part of th the outside world. Um, one thoughtful white man spoke up and identified himself as a kind of moderate Republican and was kind of bewildered as to why any of the women in the class would be afraid of him. And um, uh, we, in one, one case, we had a couple of Trump supporters talk about how the fact that at a, at a place like UVA, if they said they were Trump supporters, they would be vilified. And we, I think in, the, in our class period, we did very well with that. We 
we let everybody listen to everybody else. But in general, the audience that I draw of the uh, liberal women, both white and of color, um, frightened, distressed, probably frightened and distressed more than angry, some anger, some expressions of we, we must become more political, some expressions of, uh, from students who are deeply committed to environmental issues and know that yeah. Trump is the guy that says climate, climate change is a hoax. Invented by the Chinese. Invented by the Chinese. So yeah. two, or, two or three students expressed grave worries about that. Um, so that's the range of opinions I Are they I overreacting, heard. you think, Richard? We're seeing protests in the streets. Well, We're seeing you know, people moving to Canada or talking about it. Are, no, why should we talk about overreaction? This is social life, right? This is a, an election as an important event. It, it is designed to, as a ritual, to increase people's public awareness and get them to express their participation in the nation. And part of one's participation in the, ma in the nation can be a cry of dismay at the direction the nation is taking. So I don't think we should call it an overreaction. We should call it um, a, a kind of full um, participation in a we're ritual. We're doing exactly what we're supposed to do in, a, in exactly, this Exactly, in a yeah. ritual that happens yeah. every four years. So right. um, we don't, I don't think we have to say that it's an overreaction. Uh, I, I will say to you and the audience that uh, I, I, I tried to conduct these talks with my students um, in a very respectful way when you, I, did, they, I asked them, did, did they want me to lecture and hold class or did they want to process the, the election? And of, of two, let's say 250 students, only one said she didn't want to talk about it. Wow. And I was made sure, but she said, if you all want to talk about it, go ahead. And I made sure she was okay with that. But the point is, I was very careful to try to do this in a way that um, yeah. was constructive. So um, they're frightened and worked up, and who knows if they'll become, uh, you know, one of the things Bernie Sanders wanted was that young people get involved in politics. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Richard, thank you for being here. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Uh, Thanks my pleasure. so much. Richard Handler is a professor of anthropology at the University of Virginia and director of the Global Studies Program. You can find the complete archive of this program online at mediaandcitizenship.org. Have a terrific week, and you all be good to each other.